Okay, folks, I did it. I bit the bullet and watched all of and just like that. And I'm here to tell you all about it. Remember how Sex in the City was a great exploration of four extremely fabulous women that were very different from each other who still managed to have beautifully deep friendships, all while sipping Manhattans and exploring their fascinating dating lives. Remember how the dialogue was so clever, the men super sexy, and lessons so deep and poignant, yeah? Well, they took all of that out of the reboot. And just like that, they left us with just a whole lot of boring. Boring in what way, you ask? Don't worry. Today, I'm going to tell you in full detail. So this is your spoiler warning for the complete season of And Just Like That. God, the title does not fit well into a sentence. Okay, let's start with the most obvious reason for why And Just Like That was so boring. The tone. Now, here's spoiler number one, and if you're still here and don't want spoilers, get out of here! Trust me, you don't want to find out how Peloton accidentally triggered a major drop in their share prices because of a misguided sponsorship. I'm not joking, this really happened. So for a show that kicks things off with a big death, it was clear that maintaining the lighthearted tone of Sex and the City would be impossible. But the result was that the episodes were very quiet missing Carrie's much-needed rumination on everything that she and her friends were going through. Instead, there were plenty of scenes of Carrie texting people, going into her closet, texting more people, going into her closet again, putting on rings, taking off rings, putting on rings and then taking off rings, and putting big on a shelf with her shoes. Okay, I, I understand that these were meant to be very emotional scenes, capturing how lost Carrie felt, but instead, I just felt lost lost of any interest. And the little, and just like that, moments at the end of each episode really did not help. And just like that, Have fun. I was up for a dance. Okay, that doesn't make any sense, and do not tell me it's poignant. It's not. If you say it's deep, you are lying to yourself. The second reason it's really boring is because of the characters. Carrie is fine, she's in mourning, so she's just quiet a lot, but Miranda and Charlotte seem like these infantile, flat versions of themselves. In the original series, Charlotte was far more interesting and nuanced than just an over-eager prom queen, and Miranda was a stubborn, strong force to be reckoned with. And let's not forget the healthy dose of skepticism that she ate for breakfast every morning. And now in And Just Like That, what happened to Miranda? No, I'm serious. Why is she so smiley and apologetic and a pandering people pleaser? This is the woman that could eat anyone alive if she wanted to and hold her own corner like nobody's business. And that's what made Steve such a great match for her because where she was hard and rigid, he was understanding and placating. And together, they were able to create a great partnership. For this video, I went back and rewatched the two movies. I didn't love them when I had first seen them in theaters, but compared to the reboot, the movies were far better at capturing the tone of Sex and the City and the characters. While Steve and Miranda navigate some choppy waters, they come through, and in the second movie, there are very cute moments between the two of them, where in very typical Steve fashion, he's able to convince Miranda to step away from a professional situation that was making her sick. He's sexy and clearly madly in love with Miranda. But in the reboot, what happened to Steve? Because, hang on, what, what has happened to him? So he's geriatric Steve now? He can't hear anyone. Probably can't hear himself either, which is for the best because he sounds like this now. I have been dying to meet you. You are the only person I know who intimidates her. Can someone explain to me why he sounds like an old geezer from the 1950s named Marv? And this is sort of true for all the men in the show. They're either dead or boring, which makes me wish they were dead. Remember when the men on the show were hot and interesting, even if they only came around for an episode? Now we have to deal with men like Boring Peter, who teaches the history of boring at Boring High. Not to be confused with Boring Bachelor Number 2, whose name I can't even remember and I don't care to look up because you guessed it, he's boring. What happened to all the sexy men? There was one sexy male character and one interesting flirtatious exchange that Seema got to partake in, but that was it. Some of the newer female characters have depth to them, but the men are just flat. Their desires, their wants are easily written off as mansplaining. I went for the ball, which you had literally just mansplained me to do. Wait, what now? Even when Andre shows his desire for a child, instead of it being explored, it's just marginalized and written off as programming, as if his desire doesn't matter, especially if it contradicts what Naya wants. Okay, moving on to reason number three. 
storylines. The storylines were incredibly immature. Don't get me wrong, there were plenty of deep topics that the show brought forth, like the struggles with alcoholism, losing your husband and dealing with acceptance, the struggle between husband and wife when the husband wants a child and the wife is not sure or unable, or a relationship feeling a little redundant and boring after years and years, and also circumstances like children constrained changing their gender and identity and the parents finding out from administrators. And these were all very interesting themes, but they were all underexplored. In fact, they were just quickly swept under the rug after being brought up, except for the safest one, and that was Carrie's bereavement. Miranda's alcoholism was a big deal, and she dropped it in an instant by pouring out her supply, and that was it. Any desire to discuss the issue by Charlotte was just brushed aside by Carrie as awkward and unnecessary. Three tiny Tito's bottles, that is weird. Well, maybe she was having a tiny party in her backpack. And tonight, before the show, I noticed she had two glasses of wine. Okay, could you stop noticing things? Miranda's singular, one single attempt to work on her marriage was it. After that, she was ready to walk away from her most significant relationship to be with someone who uses the fact that they smoke a lot of pot and that's why they didn't respond to a DM. And why are you guys talking about DMs? You're in your 50s. Why can't you just call it messaging? The immaturity of Miranda's entire approach to her marriage, her willingness to just throw Steve away, her willingness to just tell Che she loves them, despite not knowing anything about Che. Even when Che says to Miranda, hey, I can't offer you anything traditional, the skeptic in Miranda would normally ask, wait, what does that mean? What exactly am I taking on here? Instead, she just gushes and says it's fine and is already mentally drawing up divorce papers that I'm sure she will DM Steve later. The Steve storyline really upset a lot of people, with justice for Steve making the rounds on Twitter. I get it though, I'm sure the writers really wanted to pursue a non-traditional relationship on the show since diversity in the original show has been questioned in recent years. And while Miranda seems like the obvious answer, a better answer would have been to use a new set of characters for that and leave Miranda and Steve's relationship intact since viewers had fallen in love with them over a very long time. That was definitely a big miscalculation on the writer's part. But continuing this issue of immaturity, Carrie's entire conflict with Natasha and the discovery that Big had left his ex-wife some money was another instance of the show overemphasizing a non-issue. With 15 plus years passed since Big and Natasha's marriage ended, I found it a little hard to believe that Natasha was still holding on to an intense grudge and stabbing little Carrie voodoo dolls in the privacy of her office. Natasha is clearly a very successful woman and has a family. How is it that she's not mature enough to answer an email from a grieving widow who's looking for answers after her husband's death? And how come Carrie is not able to see that maybe Big left Natasha money because he was feeling guilty? Instead, she questions her entire marriage on the basis of one thing and a photo of a dog. And she needs to hear from Natasha that Big loved her. I never understand and why he ever married me when he was always in love with you. But honestly, this entire storyline pales in comparison to Carrie's obsession with her younger neighbor and her desire to be cool. Isn't that a little immature? In fact, the girls had a much better perspective on this in their 30s. Excuse me, do you remember us in our 20s? Dimly. Have a little compassion, ladies. The only thing worse than being single and in your 30s in this city is being single and in your 20s. But here we are again, 20-something years later, where Carrie is craving the validation of a 20-something who is having public, messy, half-naked fights with her so-called boyfriend. Look, I'm nitpicking here, but let me ask an important question. Which audience is the show targeting? Is it the original audience from the Sex and the City show? Because those folks are in their 50s, 40s, and 30s now, and this immature rubbish is not interesting to them. So is the target audience Gen Z? Because I can guarantee it that they are not interested in hearing about the struggles with widowhood, and menopause. And yet, we get moments where Miranda is acting like a schoolgirl, chasing after Che rom-com style. So taking a step away from and just like that, let's talk about Sex and the City and what made that show so successful and interesting. Aside from the swanky lifestyle, hunky men, and clever writing, the real draw of the show was the exploration of varying viewpoints. The four women were fantastically different, and the meat of each episode was their discussion of their differences. Samantha was the sexually evolved, confirmed bachelor, who often butted heads with the conservative Charlotte, who was on the hunt for a fairy tale love life. Miranda was the ultra-independent, career-focused pessimist, and Carrie was somewhere in between, able to 
see all of their perspectives and use that to navigate her love life. It's these diverse viewpoints that made women everywhere see themselves in these characters, since the characters were arguing issues and concerns that the modern woman was facing. Most episodes tackled important questions like, are we all sluts? Or do women just want to be rescued? And the women challenged each other, and the whole episode followed the arguments playing out on screen, with finally a conclusion from Carrie that ultimately represented a transcendent viewpoint. A great example of this is the episode where Charlotte is finally tired of Samantha's overly sexual talk. Sex is something special that's supposed to happen between two people who love each other. Or two people who love sex. Oh my god, you're such a- A what? What am I, Charlotte? What I love about this episode is that Charlotte walks away from that table convinced that Samantha is wrong about how she views sex. And Samantha is convinced that Charlotte is too much of a prude. As the episode plays out, however, Charlotte discovers her inner Samantha and where she needs to let loose and be more open to experiences, while Samantha discovers that she has her own limits to what level of expression she can tolerate. And let's be honest, it's these conflicts and compromises that made the show fascinating because it was talking about things that weren't commonly talked about, but still there was a realism in how friendships are maintained, and that's by seeing each other's viewpoints and accepting where you are wrong. But fast forward to 2022, where the cultural landscape has dictated that while genders and sexual orientation can be fluid and non-binary, opinions need to be anything but that. It's quite black and white. You're either with us or you're the worst person that has ever existed. Looking back on Sex in the City, a lot of the opinions voiced on the show are now considered toxic. The girls teasing Samantha for her weight gain in the movies is considered toxic. Asking the question, are we all sluts, is considered toxic. The result of the current woke lens on the original Sex and the City show is that, save for Samantha, all the other women's opinions are mostly unacceptable. Even Miranda, who was an exemplary career-oriented woman, is now looked at as a corporate shell who gave up her cynicism to settle down for a very traditional family. And Charlotte, well, Charlotte is apparently the worst of them for being so conservative in her desires for a husband and children. And while Carrie Miranda and Charlotte have been downgraded in their standing, Samantha has been elevated to godlike status for her forward-thinking vision and willingness to throw over any man to maintain her independence. I love you, but I love me more. Unfortunately for the show, she was very clearly missing in action. So no wonder the rest of the characters sound like flat and boring versions of themselves. Culturally, they're not really allowed to have an opinion, at least not without being burned at the stake. So what does that translate to? Well, no conflict, lest we offend anyone. Here's a great example of this new no conflict philosophy. I'm gonna ask Steve for a divorce. I, I can't sneak around anymore. It's not fair to Che or to Steve or to you. I guess you know what you're doing. Oh. No, I mean it, Miranda. It's your life. What do I know about how you should handle it? I cannot even handle my own life right now. Remember at the end of season six in Sex and the City, when Carrie abandoned her work, her city, and even her voice to go be in Paris with the Russian? Well, she was thoroughly challenged by her good friend Miranda and came to see that Miranda was right and that she had made a mistake. Well, what about when Miranda gives up a very important internship, something Naya worked hard to help her get, gives up her life, gives up her friends to move across the country for someone who didn't even give her a proper heads up? When she tells her friends about her decision, they quickly move through worry, annoyance, fear, and straight to support, lest they be labeled as judgmental. I got it. Go for it. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna be in LA with Che. Wait, how have I not heard about this? See? I'm not the only one. I'm in love. I'm so happy for you! <laughs> Thank you. Sex and the City was about many things, but truly it was about friendship and how friends can challenge you, push you, support you, and love you. I feel bad enough already. Good. You should feel bad. Do you ever think about how she'd feel if she found out? Yes, I think about it all the time. No, you don't. You think about what would happen to you if she found out. You don't think about her. But that crucial aspect of being challenged by the people around you now seems to have gone out of style. Questioning people or challenging them to think through their decisions is now looked at as undermining or even worse, controlling. Miranda is drinking too much. We're accepting of that fact since the current times can lead to people overindulging. We don't want to seem overly privileged and unsympathetic to someone's circumstances. There's a lot to drink about lately. In fact, if we're gonna have this conversation, I'm gonna need a drink. Miranda is leaving Steve for a person she barely knows. We are accepting of extramarital affairs since we don't want to judge someone's relationship, especially from a privileged position. The worst of this was when they broached the very awkward situation where Charlotte and Harry find out about an important decision made by their daughter from the school administrators. 
we're just, we're a little taken aback that this particular child was allowed to adopt a new name without the parents being informed. Rock never gave us any clue that their parents were resistant to their changing identity. There? Did, did you just say there? We are not resistant, Robin. This is such a significant issue, but yet again, the show is forced to quickly sweep it under the rug, lest they be labeled as bigoted. Hearing people who aren't you talk about your kid to you, it's the most humbling experience I've ever had as a father. And the men had to be super boring. In the post Me Too era, where Mr. Big has been canceled, there is no room for sexy, interesting men. What do we think in time frame wise about our next IVF round? I don't know, Andre. Uh, my body still feels off from that last round. And why are we talking about this as I'm getting on mass transit? Uh, Samuel's just kind of pushing me about whether I'm going out on the tour or not. And now you're pushing me? Am I? Um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. My bad. I just, just I didn't want to keep him hanging. They've been so good to me. No, they're all on a leash. Harmless, pandering, unassuming, apologizing for everything while the women dig in their heels. What's interesting is that Sex and the City had an episode called Cover Girl, where Samantha and Carrie have a falling out when Carrie witnesses Samantha getting a little too friendly with the Worldwide Express guy. The whole episode becomes an exploration of what role the concept of judgment plays or should play day to day. Carrie comes to realize that even if she wouldn't participate in certain activities, she should not judge and be more accepting of her friend. And Samantha realizes that the real judgment she's afraid of is her own. And really, she was projecting her insecurities onto Carrie. But in a world where any sort of judgment, any sort of questioning of motivations, actions, opinions is considered oppressive and controlling, or worse, what is a show that became successful for challenging people's opinions and having loud personalities supposed to do? I guess all that silence really does make sense now. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.